For as kid-friendly as Pokemon seems to be, their evil teams have really run through the gauntlet of villainy. I mean, they've had everything from the Italian Mafia who will do anything for money, to an insane nihilist trying to summon an eldritch god to reset the universe, to a whole bunch of simps. But of all the evil teams, Generation 3's Team Magma and their leader Maxi have always stood out to me. Because on the surface, their plan doesn't seem all that bad. They simply want to summon the legendary Groudon to expand the land to give humans more space to live. I mean, sure, it kind of sucks for all the water Pokemon, but uh, sucks to suck, my dudes. But today, I wanted to actually dig deep into the science behind Team Magma's grand plan to see if it would actually work and the disastrous possible side effects if it does. Now, while this may sound complicated, luckily, all the science today is very basic. We must simply understand the behavior of rain. So, wait, what is that? What is that? Wait, no, 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 no! Richard, hit that intro. This video was voted on by all my patrons. If you like what I do here on the channel and want to help me make more content like this in the future, then supporting on Patreon honestly helps way more than you know. It'll also get you access to all sorts of cool perks like early access, exclusive live streams, and access to our private Discord server. All right, now back to the science. Before we begin breaking down Team Magma's master plan, we first need to understand exactly what they're planning to do. Maxi's big concern is that of overpopulation. He's worried that humanity is limited by the physical space they have available to them, and that if they want to advance further as a species, they'll need more space. So he plans to summon the legendary Pokemon of the land, Groudon, and harness its ability Drought to dry out the oceans and reclaim some of that land. Now, ignoring the fact that the vast majority of the Pokemon world is made up of completely uninhabited routes that humanity could totally populate if they so choose, and that they've already figured out how to build settlements over the ocean in the exact same region where Maxiu lives, so it seems like this whole space thing is basically a non-issue. I forgot the point I was trying to make. What the hell do you mean, not enough space, Max? You have unlimited space. Oh yeah, so basically their plan is to increase the power of the sun to dry up some of the oceans. That sounds like it basically makes sense, but to understand if and how they could actually pull this off, we first need to understand the science of evaporation. You probably know evaporation as one of the steps of the water cycle. Y'all know the Steve song, vapor goes up and the rain comes down. And we sort of intuitively know that when water gets hot, it evaporates. But why does it do that? I mean, the ocean water isn't boiling or anything. Well, that can be explained by one simple truth. Water is sticky. That may sound counterintuitive to anyone who's gotten even a little bit of water on their bathroom floor that made them slip and accidentally give their toilet an elbow drop like their macho man Randy Savage, but it's true. To recap for anyone who hasn't taken a chemistry class in a while, an individual water molecule is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, hence H2O. These atoms are able to bond together like this by sharing a few negatively charged electrons, one of the three elementary particles that make up all atoms. However, in the case of an H2O molecule, the oxygen atom isn't too great at sharing, and it tends to pull the electrons away from the hydrogen. And remember, 
Since electrons are negatively charged, if they tend to spend more time around the oxygen atom than they do with the hydrogen atoms, then that means that the oxygen side of the water molecule will be slightly negatively charged, and the hydrogen side will be slightly positively charged. And as any physicist or YA novelist who thinks the laws of physics are directly applicable to the way that different personalities interact, opposites attract. This means that every water molecule is basically like a teeny tiny little magnet, with the negative side of one sticking to the positive side of another. This type of bond is referred to as a hydrogen bond. Because I guess it's got hydrogen in it. Get enough of these molecules together and more and more of these bonds will form and voila! Water is sticky. The process of water sticking to itself is referred to as cohesion. So you got a bunch of water molecules all sticking together with these hydrogen bonds. And if you left them alone like this, that's how they would stay. But what happens if you introduce a little bit of heat into this system? Heat is simply a form of kinetic energy, meaning the energy of motion. So if you heat up the surface of some water, those molecules will absorb that energy and start to move. If you give them enough energy, they'll eventually move fast enough to break free of those hydrogen bonds, escaping the surface of the water and turning into water vapor. This process is what makes evaporation possible. So on the surface, it seems like Team Magma's plan is grounded in real science. If Groudon intensifies the sun's strength, it will increase the temperature of the earth, more heat will hit the surface of the ocean, which will make the water evaporate faster. If you only spend about five minutes researching, this all checks out. But if Maxi had simply scrolled a little further down on that Wikipedia page, he'd have seen that it's not quite so simple. For starters, the oceans are not just filled with water, they're filled with salt water. It's not simply a sea of H2O molecules like our example before, it's got little NaCl compounds dispersed throughout. And this makes a huge difference. Because while a water molecule is slightly charged, a salt molecule is very charged. They can hold onto water molecules far stronger than water molecules can hold onto each other. This is no longer cohesion, this is adhesion. Adhesion means two different things sticking together as opposed to cohesion where something is sticking to itself. It's not actually that dramatic. I don't know why they needed two separate names. It's the same idea. So what does this mean for Team Magma? Well, it means that salt water is going to take a lot more heat to evaporate compared to fresh water because those hydrogen bonds are a lot stronger here. This is a big problem considering we need fresh water to do the whole, you know, living thing. So sure, if Groudon were able to heat up the planet enough, it could accelerate the evaporation of the planet's oceans. But before it got to that, it would completely dry up our lakes and rivers that we drink from, leach all the water from the ground to decimate our crops, and eviscerate just about every ecosystem on the planet. So congratulations, you have successfully given humanity more land to do stuff. Hope you never get thirsty, uh, ever again. You can't drink anymore. But believe it or not, it actually gets worse. Because all this time we've just been kind of assuming that, yeah, hey, Groudon can increase the heat because magic? But the exact mechanics of how it's achieving this could tell us a lot about the other unintended side effects of this here plan. Groudon's ability to vaporize the very oceans on mass can be explained by its much less cool in-game ability, Drought, which, uh, you know, just makes it a little bit sunny for a little while, which, you know, is not at all what an actual drought is, but we'll go with it. It seems like Groudon is 
increasing the amount of heat imparted on the Earth by the sun, which increases the rate of evaporation, and we get more land. Now, we could interpret this as Groudon increasing the power of the sun, but we can actually get a little more specific than that. Earlier, when talking about evaporation, I said that energy in the form of heat was absorbed by water molecules. That heat energy largely comes from a type of radiation emitted from the sun known as infrared radiation. This is a type of light, but not a type of light that we can see. Light travels in the form of waves, and the distance between two peaks of one of these waves is called the wave length. Our eyes are only equipped to see light of wavelengths of 380 to 700 nanometers, very, very tiny, which we call the visible light spectrum. Light with longer wavelengths than that, up to around a million nanometers, is called infrared light. The sun emits a lot of infrared light, nearly half of all its radiation, and it's the type of light that specifically energizes the particles in our atmosphere, which we call heat. So, increasing the amount of radiation that the sun outputs would result in more infrared radiation hitting the Earth, which would increase the temperature and accelerate evaporation, exactly what Team Magma is after. It would also increase the amount of visible light that the sun is outputting, making the sun appear brighter, just like we see in the games, and it would increase the amount of ultraviolet light, which has the ability to damage your DNA and give you cancer, and then you die. So, you know, not the best solution. Uh, now, I know Groudon is a legendary Pokemon with godlike abilities, but having the power to manipulate the strength of the very sun seems a little far-fetched to me. Luckily, there is an easier solution. Earth is an open system when it comes to energy. Radiation from the sun comes in, hangs around for a bit, and then leaves. If you want to increase the amount of infrared radiation on Earth, you could increase the input, or you could decrease the output. Find a way to trap that infrared radiation here on Earth so it can continue to energize those water particles and evaporate them away to make room for your sweet, sweet land. A perfect solution to Team Magma's problem. I mean, it's honestly kind of crazy that nobody has thought about doing this sooner. I mean, this seems like it will have zero unintended consequences. Guys, guys, we should totally get on this in real... Oh, wait a second. It turns out that the ability to trap infrared radiation in the atmosphere is not some mythical power that only a deity could possess. It's something that we humans are really good at. And it's actually a lot easier than it sounds. Remember earlier when we talked about how water molecules can absorb infrared radiation and hold onto it for a while? The reason it's able to do that is because of its shape. Like how drinking too much coffee can give you the shakes, when a water molecule absorbs infrared radiation, it begins to vibrate. The angle fluctuates, and the kinetic energy from this motion is what allows it to escape and turn into a vapor. Perfectly symmetrical molecules like O2 and N2 can't really do this, there's no angle to change, but more complex gases like CO2 and methane are really good at this. And unlike water, which will eventually release that energy when it condenses, carbon dioxide can hold onto this energy for a long time, keeping it trapped in the atmosphere. We call these types of gases greenhouse gases. Get enough of them floating around in the atmosphere and they will absorb a lot of infrared radiation. They'll be vibrating like crazy, which is a lot of kinetic energy. And remember, kinetic energy is heat. So the more greenhouse gases you have in the atmosphere, the hotter it will get. We call this effect global warming. You've probably heard all sorts of things about global warming in the news, and you've probably noticed that it's maybe not as helpful as Maxi might have thought. Because you see, temperatures affect a lot of things here on Earth. Possibly chief among them is the weather. 
higher localized temperatures would result in increased winds, and higher evaporation rates would necessarily result in a higher amount of rain. It's called the water cycle after all, it's gotta come back down eventually. And as a matter of fact, as opposed to the droughts that we see in the game, research suggests that an increase in global temperature could actually lead to stronger storms. Instead of a global drying effect, what we would instead see is more extreme weather the world over. Droughts would become drier, storms would become stronger, certain bodies of water may dry up, but other parts of the world would experience mass flooding. Not exactly what Team Magma's after. The long and short term effects of global warming are still being researched, but it's pretty safe to say that none of them are particularly good. Global warming here on Earth was really an unintended result of us burning large amounts of fossil fuels. We only did it because we wanted energy. It's certainly not the type of thing that you would intentionally induce on your own planet. Because to recap, Maxi's grand plan is to increase the infrared radiation in the atmosphere, which will raise global temperatures, eviscerate the world's drinking supply, cause extreme droughts in certain areas of the world, rendering them near uninhabitable, and massive storms in other areas, which would result in mass flooding, destroying the land that was already inhabited. But hey, think about all that new land that we're gonna get. All those barren, sandy wastelands that were the bottom of the ocean. Great. Oh yeah! Except no, you wouldn't even get that. Because one side effect of global warming that we do know about is the melting of the polar ice caps. Here on Earth, it's estimated that around 2% of all the world's water is contained within the frozen ice caps at the North and South Poles. Now, 2% might not sound like a lot, until you realize that that equates to around 5.77 million cubic miles of water. And when that water melts, it has nowhere to go but into the oceans. Here on Earth, this melting has caused sea levels to rise by around 0.13 inches every single year. So not only is Team Magma introducing all of those other terrible ecological effects, they're also not even creating any new land. In fact, it kind of seems like Team Aqua should be giving ground on a call. And you know the worst part? This is a world where you can canonically build a city on a bunch of rafts, so they didn't even need this land in the first place. This man is literally out here trying to cause global catastrophes for no re- You know what, Maxi, you've lost your glasses privileges. So as I said, all very basic science. A couple of weeks ago, I broke down the real world science behind Team Magma's plan. You all seemed to really like that video, and wanted me to do a similar thing with Team Aqua. There's just one problem though, and that's that, well, it's super obvious that Team Aqua's plan is terrible. Mass flooding is great if you're a fish, but I'm not sure if you've noticed this or not, uh, but we're not fish. Team Aqua's plan is incredibly destructive. But it's also supposed to be incredibly destructive. Their goal is to help marine ecosystems thrive at the expense of human civilizations. So sitting here poking fun at all the ways it could harm humans seems a little redundant. I mean, it's not like a prolonged global rainstorm would cause severe and irreversible damage to marine and terrestrial ecosystems alike and result in the death of around 50% of all water type Pokemon or anything crazy like that. <laughs> There's a title appearing behind me, isn't there? Uh, I'm getting smaller in the frame so you can read it better. Well, that's not a great sign. Richard... Hit that intro. For those 
those who haven't played Pokemon Sapphire yet or need a refresher, Team Aqua are basically just huge water type Pokemon stands. They love them some fish, and they're real mad that we humans keep messing up all their water. So they plan to summon the legendary Pokemon Kyogre, who's capable of creating massive rainstorms that will raise sea levels worldwide and give water Pokemon more space to thrive. Now, immediately, there's one question we need to ask. Is this even possible? Could Kyogre really summon a rainstorm so powerful that it would flood the whole Earth? That may seem like an obvious yes. Given enough time, Kyogre could keep pumping water down onto the Earth until even the highest mountains were underwater. But it's actually a bit more complicated. See, rain is not some magical water that materializes out of the sky, it's part of the water cycle. Water in lakes and oceans evaporates, turns into clouds, and eventually comes back down as rain. We went over this cycle in way more detail in the Team Magma video, so I won't rehash it all again, but the important thing is that this cycle is a closed system. There's no new water coming into or leaving Earth. The water that we've got is all the water we're gonna get. So the very best that Kyogre could do would be to put all the world's water into the oceans. So how much water would that be? Well, there's an estimated 322,519,000 cubic miles of water here on Earth. 96.5% of that water is already in the oceans. That leaves 11,515,729 cubic miles or around 12 quintillion gallons of water stored in lakes, rivers, clouds, the ground, basically anywhere that isn't the oceans. Assuming the Pokemon world is roughly similar to our own, if Kyogre was able to convert every single drop of that water into rain and pour it into the oceans, accounting for the fact that 29% of the Earth is covered in land, it would raise the sea level by around 124 meters or 408 feet all around the world. This would cause absolutely devastating flooding to all coastal areas. Basically, every small island would completely sink, along with the entirety of the U.S. states of Delaware, Florida, Louisiana, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Mississippi, Maryland, and South Carolina. However, any part of the world with an elevation above 407 feet would be completely untouched by the oceans at least. I mean, they're still getting absolutely trashed by a storm this big. So long story short, it's impossible to completely flood the earth using rain alone. There simply is not enough water. So take that, everyone who commented on my 1 billion lions video. Get out of here. It's that time of the video again where I ask you to do stuff. Hey, hey, I see you mousing over the progress bar down there to look where to skip to, but wait just a second. I know that everybody hates these parts of the video, so I won't bore you with some long drawn out plea for your money. It'll be the fastest plea for money you've ever seen in your life. <sighs> this channel was made possible with the help of all my supporters on Patreon. For just a couple of bucks a month, you can get access to all sorts of cool perks like early access to videos, two exclusive live streams a month where I play through whatever game you want me to, a private Discord for fellow gamers and science enjoyers, and suggesting and voting on future video topics for this show. If you want to support, click the link at the top of the description down below. If you're not able to support the channel directly but still want to help out, drop a comment below saying literally anything you want and click the subscribe button. Let's be honest, it doesn't really do anything for you, it won't guarantee that YouTube will show you my videos in the future, but it does help my channel out in the algorithm. And most importantly, if you like this video, tune in next week. I post new videos every single Saturday. I have a whole bunch on my channel, so if you want to see my new videos as soon as they come out, don't rely on some fickle algorithm. Take a page out of Thanos' book and do it yourself.
Whew, if that isn't enough to earn a sub, I don't know what is. All right, now, uh, this guy was talking about fish or something, I don't know. But then again, Kyogre is a magical dolphin from the dawn of time, so just for the sake of argument, let's say that instead of creating rain through evaporation, it can just magically make as much water as it wants. In that case, in order to completely flood the Earth up to the peak of Mount Everest, Kyogre would need to rain down one billion, 86 million, 221,420 cubic miles of water. That's a lot of rain. The world record for the most rainfall in a 24 hour period is held by Tropical Storm Claudette, which dropped 42 inches or 1,067 millimeters of rain down on Alvin, Texas. If Kyogre could create a storm of this severity across the entire world, then it would take 22.7 years of constant rain to completely flood the world. And believe it or not, in a storm like that, the flooding is the least of your worries. Well, no, that's not true. If you live on land, then the flooding, it's pretty bad. What I'm trying to say is, summoning a storm that covers the entire world for two decades can have some unintended consequences. For starters, heavy rain clouds can block around 69% of all sunlight. How bad is this? Oh, I don't know. Maybe ask the dinosaurs. See, 66 million years ago, the dinosaurs were chilling out, living their best lives like they had for the past 165 million years, until a big ol' 8 mile wide asteroid hit the Earth at 45,000 miles per hour. I hate it when that happens. This caused massive earthquakes and wildfires that killed a lot of the dinosaurs outright, but it also kicked a ton of dust and ash up into the atmosphere that completely blocked out the sun for 15 years. This resulted in global temperatures dropping to around 46 degrees Fahrenheit or 7.8 degrees Celsius, triggering a global winter that lasted for decades and a period of ice ages that lasted 2 million years. This is what 20 years of obscured skies will do, and it's this same fate that awaits the Pokemon world. Granted, ash and dust obscure sunlight better than clouds, so the effects might not be so extreme, but we can expect a great deal of Team Aqua's brand spanking new water to turn to ice. This global winter completely finished off the terrestrial dinosaurs, but more importantly for today's discussion, it also devastated the marine ecosystems. In our world, photosynthesizing plankton make up the basis for every marine food chain. But without sunlight to get energy, around 90% of these plankton died. Along with them, around 55% of all marine mammals, 43% of turtles, 9% of sharks, and 100% of marine dinosaurs went extinct. All because the sun got a little covered for a few decades. In summoning Kyogre, Team Aqua could certainly create more space for water Pokemon. There just might not be that many water Pokemon left to enjoy it. Of course, this is the most extreme example. In reality, Team Aqua never wanted to flood the entire Earth. Just make it rain for a little while and raise the oceans a little bit. Realistically, Kyogre can make a storm lasting a couple days, raise the sea levels by... 25 feet, and that'd be more than enough for water-type Pokemon to thrive. A plan that simple might have worked perfectly, save for one tiny little issue that makes even a plan this modest 
quite possibly the most harmful thing you could do to marine ecosystems. And that issue is us. Folks, I want to take you on a little journey as we follow the life of a water bottle. Picture this. You're deep in the heat of battle against Youngster Joey. Your mudkip is low on health, so you give it a fresh water. And when you're done, you toss that bottle aside. Just leave it exposed to the elements. Most things when left out like this will eventually decompose. Outside forces like rain and wind and bacteria will break the chemical bonds that hold their molecules together, reducing them to their base natural components. However, plastics are different. Their long polymer chains are held together with carbon bonds, which are far stronger than the chemical bonds found in other materials. When something plastic is left out to the elements, sure, it will crack and break down, but it won't truly decompose on a molecular level to its base natural components. Instead, that plastic bottle will simply break into smaller and smaller plastic bits. We call this microplastic pollution. Now, microplastics are bad enough when left on the side of the road, but things get really bad when these microplastics get into the water. For starters, because these plastic bits are so tiny, often less than 5 millimeters across, they're nearly impossible to clean up. Once they get into the water, they're there to stay. This is a really bad thing because fish will often mistake these floating plastic bits for food. Ingesting plastic can lead to all sorts of nasty health effects and can damage the tissue, nerves, even the genetics of not only the fish that ate the plastic, but also anything else higher up the food chain. And do you want to know the number one way these microplastics end up in the water in the first place? It's not pollution from boats or commercial fishing or ocean dumping. It's rain. An estimated 80% of the trash and microplastic pollution in our oceans and lakes right now started out as simple litter on the side of the road maybe miles from any coast. When it rains, the runoff water will naturally flow back into large bodies of water, maybe through man-made structures like gutters and storm drains. And it carries all that trash with it, breaking it up into smaller and smaller pieces as it goes, filling marine habitats with deadly microplastics. This isn't some hypothetical scenario, it's something that happens here, in real life, every day, all over the world. If Kyogre really did summon a massive global rainstorm, sure, it might rise sea levels a little bit, but it would bring all that trash with it. Sure, you're creating more space for water Pokemon, but not any space they'd want to live in. So, what's the lesson? Well, Archie, it's actually pretty simple. Water Pokemon, and indeed all marine life, don't need more space. The oceans are vast. There's more than enough room for all manner of fish, whales, and turtles, and all the creatures of the sea to live and thrive. It's not about giving them more space. It's about preserving the space they already have. So the next time you drink out of a plastic bottle, toss it in the nearest recycling bin. You might just save a fish and stop a crazy pirate from flooding the entire world. A few months ago, I made a pair of videos breaking down the real world science behind the legendary Pokemon Kyogre and Groudon and what would happen if Team Aqua and Team Magma were successful in their plans. And ever since then, people have been begging me to complete the trilogy. For those who don't know, Team Sky is not an official Pokemon team, 
but rather the creation of Michael from the channel MJ TV. And just like Team Aqua and Magma before them, their goal is to summon the legendary titan Rayquaza to expand the sky itself! <laughs> Either that, or they just really like flying Pokemon, I can't really tell. But there is one thing that I know for certain. No Pokemon team is complete without a nerdy guy in glasses. So Michael, consider this my official application. This is the real world science of Team Sky. Richard, hit that intro. This video was voted on by all my supporters on Patreon. If you want to find out how you can get access to all sorts of cool perks like an exclusive Discord server, early access, and private live streams, then check the link in the description down below. These videos would not be possible without the support of all of you, so truly, thank you all so much. Alright, now it's time to do an unreasonable amount of science for the sake of a meme. So, you want to expand the sky? Well, before you can do that, we first need to define what the sky even is. Because it turns out it may not be as cut and dry as you think. Many dictionaries define the sky as any part of the atmosphere or outer space that can be seen from Earth. So, by that definition, the limits of the sky would be the furthest celestial object that we can see from Earth, which turns out to be the star known as Arendel, which sits a cool 28 billion light years away. Which, you know, funny enough, I think is actually plenty big. But something tells me that's not what Team Sky meant. After all, the goal of Team Sky is to make more room for flying type Pokemon. Or, or, sorry, sorry, scratch that. Pokemon that can fly. And float, I guess. And Pokemon that will eventually evolve into something that can fly. Or float. Or Mighty Yenna for some reason. So I think a more reasonable definition of the sky for this video is Earth's atmosphere, which stretches from the Earth's surface to the edge of outer space. This is the area that aerial Pokemon could inhabit. Now, expanding the Earth's atmosphere is a bit tricky because, well, it already wraps all the way around the globe, so you can't expand it that way or that way or even that way. If you want to expand the sky, the only way you can go is up. So, in order to complete Team Sky's goal of expanding the sky, we must simply find a way to increase the height of the atmosphere. Sounds easy enough, only there's one problem. It turns out that defining the height of the atmosphere is a bit tricky. It's pretty common knowledge that Earth's atmosphere gets thinner and thinner the higher up you go. Or, in more scientific terms, the air density gets lower and lower. And when that density hits zero, congratulations, you're in space. But what you might not know is that air density doesn't decrease linearly. Rather, it decreases exponentially meaning that it will approach a value of zero, but never actually reach it. This means that, from a scientific perspective, there is no hard line that separates Earth's atmosphere from space. It theoretically stretches on forever. For that reason, a better way to describe the size of a planet's atmosphere is by using a factor called the scale height which is a measure of how high up you need to travel for the atmospheric pressure to decrease by a factor of 1 over E, or a little more than a third. Effectively, scale height is a measure of how much the atmosphere hugs a planet. A low scale height means that all the air of the atmosphere lies close to the surface, and the air pressure decreases rapidly as you go up. A high scale height means that pressure decreases slowly and, effectively, the sky extends further. 
So, in order to increase the size of the sky, we need to find a way to increase the scale height. Now, you could try calling upon Rayquaza to accomplish this, but that might not be your best course of action, seeing as its only cannon ability seems to be saying, Hey, knock it off! I'm trying to sleep up here! God damn. But luckily, we don't need Rayquaza. Not when we have science. The scale height of a planet can be found using this formula. H is our scale height that we're looking for, R is the molar gas constant, which is just a set value of 8.314 followed by some complete nonsense for a unit. Uh, you don't gotta worry about all that today. T is the average surface temperature of the planet, and M is the mean molar mass of atmospheric particles. Moles are a little weird, but basically it's how much this many air particles would weigh. And lastly, G is the acceleration due to gravity on the planet in question, which comes from the mass of that planet. Let's use Earth as an example. The average surface temperature of Earth is 58.73 degrees Fahrenheit or 14.85 degrees Celsius. For this formula though, we need to use the black sheep of the temperature family and convert that to 288 degrees Kelvin. In order to find the mean molar mass, we need to take the weighted average of all the different molar masses for the individual molecules that make up Earth's atmosphere. So, in Earth's case, 78% of our atmosphere is comprised of nitrogen gas, which has a molar mass of 28.2 grams per mole. Oxygen makes up 21% of the atmosphere and has a molar mass of 32 grams per mole, Argon makes up 0.9% and has a molar mass of 39.948 grams per mole, and the remaining 0.1% is made up of other gases like water vapor, CO2, and methane, which have a combined average molar mass of around 26 grams per mole. If we simply multiply each molecule's molar mass by its percent makeup and add them all together, we can find that Earth's atmosphere has an average molar mass of 28.9 grams per mole. And lastly, G represents the acceleration due to gravity, and is a measure of how fast things fall. Here on Earth, G is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. But on a place like the moon, where gravity is much lighter, g is much lower. So if we simply plug all those numbers into our formula, we can find that the scale height for Earth is 8,437.12 meters, or 5.24 miles. That's how high you'd need to travel for the atmosphere to become roughly a third as dense as it is on the surface. Great. Now comes the fun part. If you're looking to increase the scale height of the planet you're on, you got three options. The molar gas constant is a set property. Unless you're rewriting the laws of reality itself, that's not changing. So that just leaves increasing the temperature, decreasing the mean molar mass, or decreasing the pull of gravity. Let's say that Team Sky is feeling a bit ambitious and wants to double the scale height and effectively double the height of the sky. Well, you could simply take a page out of Team Magma's book and double the average global temperatures from 288 Kelvin to 576 Kelvin. Grab Groudon, let him do his thing, and after letting your Earth bake for a few hundred years, you're good to go. However, as we learned in the Team Magma video, increasing global temperatures by even a few degrees might have a couple of unintended consequences. So it might be wisest to leave the temperature alone. Instead, you could try to change the mean molar mass by physically altering the chemical makeup of our atmosphere. Remember, we calculated the mean molar mass by multiplying each molecule's molar mass by its percent makeup. You could simply replace those heavier molecules like nitrogen and oxygen with a much lighter one, like say hydrogen, 
which only has a molar mass of 2.016 grams per mole. If you could have the mean molar mass from 28.9 to 14.45 grams per mole, then mission accomplished. The sky is now doubled. However, if your goal is to help flying Pokemon thrive, this might not be your best course of action either. Uh, see, changing the makeup of our atmosphere will also change the air pressure. Air pressure is simply the weight of all the air molecules above you, and if you replace all the heavy molecules with lighter hydrogen, then you're going to have a much lighter atmosphere, and therefore far lower air pressure. And having a high air pressure is pretty important for our respiratory system. We often think of inhaling as sucking air in, but it turns out that it's actually the opposite. When you take a breath, your diaphragm contracts, giving your lungs more space to expand. Because the air pressure of the atmosphere is higher than the air pressure within your lungs, the atmosphere actually pushes air into your lungs, which allows you to breathe. This is why some people experience altitude sickness. As you go higher up, there's less air on top of you, meaning the air pressure is lower and it's more difficult to take in air. Reducing global air pressure would make it more difficult for all Pokemon, birds and Mightyena included, to survive. Birds have also been known to be super sensitive to changes in air pressure, which can cause all sorts of issues with their flight patterns. And also, probably should have mentioned this one first, but replacing all the oxygen in the air with hydrogen makes it pretty difficult for any Pokemon that needs to breathe oxygen to survive. Which, you know, is basically all of them. Alright, so temperature and atmospheric composition were sort of a bust, but fear not. There is still one more option. If we simply find a way to decrease the acceleration due to gravity, we could not only increase the height of the sky, but also gain the ability to leap high into the air like we're on the moon and join our flying brethren for but a moment. It's a win-win. So, how do we do that? Well, the acceleration due to gravity for a given planet can be found using this formula. G is another constant, this time the gravitational constant. M is the mass of the planet in question, and R is the radius, or the distance from the center of the planet to wherever you are, probably the surface. Since R is solely dependent on the place you are measuring from, the only way to reduce the gravitational pull of a planet is by reducing its mass. And so, ironically enough, if you want to expand the sky, you gotta grab a shovel. The mass of a planet is basically the combined matter of everything in it. So if you want to reduce the mass, you gotta get rid of all that matter. Now, you want to be careful here because if you lower the height of the ground level, you're reducing the distance to the center of mass, which increases gravity by a power of two, which we don't want. Instead, your best bet is to hollow that sucker out and launch all that excess material into space. Earth currently has a mass of 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. In order to double the height of the sky, you'd need to remove half of all that mass, or nearly 3 octillion kilograms of dirt and rock, enough to create 40 new moons. That is more mass than the entirety of Earth's crust, meaning that you'd have to end up digging out a significant portion of Earth's mantle, the molten hot layer of silicate rock that lies deep below the surface. What are the effects of digging this deep? Well, as it turns out, we don't know because we've never done it before. Assuming Team Sky did have the resources, funding, and time to dig down that far all around the world, we really have no way of knowing what would happen. It could create a network of super volcanoes spewing 1,800 degree rock up onto the surface, or they might effectively 
halt all seismic activity and stop any future earthquakes from occurring. You just gotta watch out for a couple of potholes here and there. And also, it's almost certainly that first one. But if you manage to successfully remove half of all the matter on Earth, then congratulations! You have officially doubled the height of the sky. Another W for Team Sky! So, there you have it. If you want to expand the sky, you must simply increase global temperatures far beyond the point that could sustain life on Earth as we know it, alter the molecular makeup of the atmosphere to the point where no living being could breathe, or find a way to hollow out half the Earth without condemning everyone and everything to a fiery death. You're welcome, Michael! Of course, there is another way. An easier and far less ecologically devastating way to expand the sky. It does require some methods that are a bit more, uh, shall we say, nefarious. But this is an evil team after all. We're not limited by petty morality. At the start of the video, I mentioned that defining the limit between outer space and Earth's atmosphere is tricky. Because while technically Earth's atmosphere does extend indefinitely, realistically, there is an end. The Andromeda Galaxy isn't in our atmosphere. Practically speaking, the sky does have a limit. But how do we know where that limit is? Luckily, there is an answer to this problem. The Karman Line, established in the 1960s, is the internationally agreed upon point that separates Earth from space. Only, it's not so agreed upon. Theodore von Karman originally defined this line as the height at which an airplane could still sustain flight, which he calculated to be about 83.8 kilometers or 52.1 miles above sea level. The World Air Sports Federation, an international record-keeping body, used this line as the dividing point between Earth and space, for the purpose of aircraft and spacecraft regulations. Only, they decided to just throw out Carmont's calculations and put it at 100 kilometers above sea level, because they were simps for Base 10. And then NASA looked at that and said, well, hang on, that's way too high and decided to set it at 50 miles, which is much closer to Karman's original calculations, but they were also simps for base 10, so they just threw those two miles out. Basically, if the Karman line is the international dividing point where the sky ends and space begins, but nobody can agree on where that line is, then we have a real opportunity here. 80 kilometers, 83, 100, screw that. From this day forth, by decree of Team Sky, the new Karman line is now 5 billion miles, and all that space is reserved exclusively for flying Pokemon. And Mighty Enna, if you got a problem with that, well, we might have to have a little, uh, conversation. Cosmo, Professor, my friend, why you gotta do this to me? We're not asking for much here, just a little uh, statement from you endorsing our new Carmon line. All we're asking for is a little cooperation. But uh, if you can't do that, then we're gonna have to resort to Plan B. And you're not gonna like Plan B, Cosmo. Because it involves superheating an atmosphere that we removed all the oxygen from using geothermal radiation from big holes that we dug down to the mantle. Do you really want that in your conscience? And thus ends my cover letter for my official application to the Team Sky Science Division. I am confident that I can use my expertise to help Team Sky accomplish their goals for creating a better life for flying Pokemon with a bit of world domination on the side. Please see my attached resume and feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. And you know, also I thought I should just let you know, I do have a uh, hundred million polka dollar offer from Team Magma, so you know, if you wanna lock this one down, you're gonna have to make me an offer that I can't refuse. Now until next time, see you around, polka fans. 
and a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby.